Hello, this is a study guide for test number two, which covers chapters 8 through 13. There are 34 questions on this test, which is a little bit less than the first test. Uh, so each test, each question counts for a little bit more. Um, this is 20% of your semester grade, unless it's the lowest test, because remember, I dropped the lowest test if you take all four. As always, you can use a calculator and you get the full 75 minutes of class to take the test. Uh, there are some sample questions in the appendix, appendix number four, at the end of your course pack, or you can also see that online. So here are some suggestions about taking the test. I would say look through those sample questions. Uh, make sure you get enough sleep the night before. Also, the math lab is open for um, a few hours, maybe about 20 hours a week. So generally, I recommend visiting the math lab if you have any specific questions. Also, it's, it's helpful to, to study with people, so study with uh, friends, that's always a helpful thing. Okay, so here are some of the things that are on the test. Uh, averages and weighted averages, counting combinations, algebra multiplying and combining like terms, different bases where we're converting numbers from base 10 into another base and vice versa. However, there won't be any decimal or fraction conversions on the test. Chapter 11 was about Mayan numbers. Uh, there are two different types of Mayan numbers, the normal numbers and the solar numbers. Chapter 13 was about exponents. So that's a quick overview. Let me go through each of these in detail. To find an average, an ordinary average, all you do is you add the numbers and then divide by how many numbers there were. So for example, if you have 85, 90, and 93, and you want to find the average of those three numbers, just add them up, and then divide by how many there were, and then you get the answer. For weighted averages, the procedure is a little bit different. First of all, you multiply each number by its weight, and then you add them up, and then you divide by the total weight, not how many numbers there were. A good example is for calculating your GPA, we do a weighted average. And so let's say you have these different grades, a B, A, B, and a C. Well, we're going to add up those grades, except that you can't really add grades, letter grades. And so first of all, we cr convert those to grade points. An A is worth 4, a B is worth 3, a C is worth 2, a D is worth 1, and so on. And so those are the numbers, the 3, 4, 3, and 2, which we are going to get the weighted average of. But instead of just doing a normal average like we did last time, this time we're going to weight these by the number of units. And so I multiply each of those numbers by the units. So you can see I'm multiplying the 3 by a 4, the 4 by a 2, the 3 by a 3, and the 2 by a 3. So I multiply them by that, then divide by the total number of units, which is 12. And so I get 2.92. And you can round uh, to a couple digits, and that'll be OK. Another type of average is average speed. So first of all, you need to determine the distance for each part. And then average speed is basically just total distance divided by total time, because speed already is um, distance divided by time. So here's an example. Find your average speed if you ride your bike 20 miles an hour for 30 minutes, and then 15 miles an hour for an hour. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the distance. So the first part, if you go 20 miles per, per hour for half an hour, then you went 10 miles. And if you go 15 miles an hour for one hour, then you went 15 miles. So next, all we need to do is figure out the total miles divided by the total hours. So the total miles is 10 plus 15. The total hours is uh, 1 half plus 1. And so we get 25 over 1.5 or 16.67 miles per hour, the total average speed. Counting combinations was another type of problem in this section. Basic counting principle says that you count the ways things can be done, and if there's more than one way, you just multiply them together. That's how you combine combinations. So here's an example. If you can order three different soups, and four different pastas for a dinner combo where you have to have at least one soup and one pasta, then how many total choices do you have? Well, it's basically three times four, so you have 12 different choices. Next, I want to review how to convert between bases. 
So first of all, for whole numbers, let's say that you want to convert from a different base into base 10. So what you need to do is determine the place values for each place, for each digit, and then add up the digits, remembering to multiply them by their place value. So base 10 is the normal base system, or normal numbers. So if the question says, what is this number in normal numbers, or in decimal, or in base 10, that's all the same thing. Here's an example. If the question said, convert 134 base 7 into base 10, or it might say, what number is 134 base 7? The first step is, first of all, to label each of the place values. So I'm going to draw these little things to remind myself where the place values are. The first one to the farthest right is worth 1. The next one is worth 7. And the next one is 7 times 7, or 49. So I take those digits, and then I multiply them by their place value. Then I add them together. So I got 49 plus 21 plus 4. And then I add them all up, and it's 74. In other words, 134 base 7 is equal to 74. For converting the other way, converting from a base 10 number or a normal number into a different base, there's basically two different ways that you can do it. First of all, you can just guess if it's a small enough number. You might be able to just figure out which digits you need and use those digits. Or you can use a series of repeated long divisions. I'll show you both here. So the first question says write 32 in base 7. So what you can do is you can kind of guess which digits will add up to be 32 if you have two digits that are worth 1 and 7. So how many 7s do you need? How many 1s do you need? Another way of thinking of this is how many groups of 7 are there in 32? And the answer is there's 4, and that counts for 28. And so you need 4 more. So you have 4, 4, so the answer is 4, 4, base 7. Now, for bigger numbers, you might not be able to think of that in your head. And so you can do a series of repeated divisions, which also works for smaller numbers if that guessing didn't work for you. Here's how you do the series of repeated divisions. Basically, you take the number, in this case 500, and repeatedly do long division, but divide it by 7, or whatever base. So 500 divided by 7 is 71 with the remainder of 3. And then you look at that 71 and ask yourself, is that small enough? In other words, is it small enough to fit in one digit? Is it smaller than 7? Is it 6 or smaller? And the answer is no. And so we take that 71 and divide it by 7. Do long division and I get 10 with the remainder of 1. Is 10 small enough? No, it's still not small enough. So I take 10, divide it by 7, I get 1 with the remainder of 3. Now with these series of divisions here, the answer is actually right there in front of you. You start with that last answer, and then you come back around the bottom and pick up each of those digits, and that's the answer. 1, 3, 1, 3, base 7. Now you can do long division on your calculator. There's another video that shows you how to do that. There are a couple of questions that ask you to do arithmetic in different bases. Addition and multiplication are two example problems that will be on the test. So here's an example addition problem. Now remember, the basic idea is that the rules of arithmetic are not different. Um, the only thing that is different is that we write the numbers in a different base. So we're going to add up the ones column here, 5 plus 4. Now 5 plus 4 has always been 9. It's not changing. It's always going to be 9. The only thing that's different is that in base 7, we write 9 different. In base 7, we write 9 as 1, 2. In other words, it's one group of 7 with 2 more. So I put the 2 down there, and I carry the 1. And again, then I add up the next column, which in this case is the 7s column, not the 10s column. So 1 plus 4 plus 3 has always been 8, and it's always going to be 8. It's just that we write 8 differently. And in base 7, we write 8 as one group of 7 plus 1 more. In other words, 8 is equal to 1, 1, base 7. And so the answer is 1, 1, 2, base 7. There were a couple other questions having to do with bases, other kinds of questions like write a number, figure out what base a certain number is written in, and find out a number with a couple clues using the Chinese remainder theorem. 
So here's an example. 54 is written as 42 base x, where x is an unknown base. Find that base. And so if we don't know what base 42 is written in, but we do know that it's worth 54, what we can do is we can label these uh, columns here. That's the ones column. That's the x's column. We don't know which column that is. And we do know that if we add up 4 times x and 2 times 1, that it should equal 54. And from that point on, it's just an algebra problem. 4x equals 54 minus 2. 4x equals 52. And so x is equal to 13, which makes sense then. 4 in the 13s column counts for 52, plus 2 more is 54. Another type of problem is the unknown number or the chapter 12 kinds of problems we did using the Chinese remainder theorem. I talked some about Chinese history. Uh, ch the Chinese actually in did a lot of mathematical discoveries and made quite a bit of progress in mathematics, but here's one example that we did in this class. A number which in base 5 ends in 3 and a number in base 7 ends in 4 is what? And so what we need to do is make two lists. First of all, we'll make a list that satisfies the first criteria, and then we'll make a list that satisfies the second one and see if there's any numbers in common. So number which in base 5 ends in 3, we'll start with the lowest number we can think of, which is just 3. And then you add 5 repeatedly. So here's another number that ends in 3, which is 8. I add 5, I add 5, add 5. Keep adding 5. And then what I do is I start another list. Uh, what is a number that ends in 4 in base 7? And the lowest number I can think of is 4. And then I add 7, and I keep adding 7 until I see if there is some kind of uh, match between those two lists. And if you look carefully, you'll see, yes, they're um, both 18, 18 is in both lists. And so the answer is 18. And actually, you don't have to do this, but if you if you did write 18 in base 5, you can see that it's 3, 3, base 5. And if you wrote 18 in base 7, it's 2, 4, base 7. And so that matches the criteria. Chapter 11 was about Mayan numbers. Mayan numbers are written in base 20, except that the digits are written as uh, lines and dots, where a line counts for 5 and a dot counts for 1. And also, there's two different kinds of Mayan numbers. The common Mayan numbers have... The, the place values being uh, 420 and 1. And then the solar Mayan numbers have 360, 20, and 1. Here's an example addition. If we're adding those two numbers, basically f the first step is pretty straightforward. We just combine all the symbols. And so in the ones column, there's just one line, and there's six dots. In the next column over, the 20s column, there are six lines. Now, we're not done yet because we can't just leave it like that. We have to do a little bit of consolidation. The first thing we're going to do is consolidate uh, five of those dots into a single line. And then we're going to take four of those lines in the next column over and move them over into one dot in the next column because four lines count for 20. And so instead of having four lines in that column, we're going to move them over and they become one dot in the, the next column over. Then maybe we'd rewrite it like that. Now, if we were go going to convert that number into base 10, we do the same kind of thing we did with other whole numbers. We mark off the, the place values and label them. That's the ones column, the twenties column, and the four hundreds column. But in this case, they're written it with different digits. That dot stands for a 1. Two lines, remember a line counts for 5. Two lines stands for 10. And two lines and a dot is 11. Then we multiply them by their place values, add them up, and we get 611. Chapter 13 was about exponents, and you can look in the chapter and review these rules. Uh, the, here are some rules for what happens if you multiply and add exponents. Some more rules. Zero. A to the 0 is 1, and if you have a negative exponent, it goes on the bottom. Here are some examples. x to the 7th times x to the 10th. If you multiply them together, you just add the exponents and get x to the 17th. x to the 7th raised to the 10th, you multiply those together and get x to the 7 times 10, or x to the 70th.
x to the 20th divided by x to the 5th. You subtract those and get x to the 15th. 4 raised to the 0 power is just 1. In fact, anything raised to the 0 power is just 1. 3 to the negative 2 is 1 over 3 squared, which is basically 1 over 9. Also, if you have a half of an exponent, or something raised to the 1 half, that's the same as square root. And in this example, the square root of 16 is 4. Um, 9 raised to the 1.5, that's the same as 9 to the 1 times 9 to the 0.5. And then we can take that second uh, 9 to the 0.5 and make it into square root of 9. So it's 9 times 3, or 27. Finally, I mentioned that there are things that are bigger than exponents. Remember, exponents are just one in this little uh, series here. We have addition, and then multiplication is the next level up. Exponents are a bunch of multiplications, but then they have these double arrow things. So the arrow notation means you do the exponent thing a bunch of times, and you can have as many arrows as you want. And so there are bigger things than exponents. Those aren't the biggest things.